Hello, I'm a student of Bhikkhu Chandana. This is just a reminder that he is a homeless monk, depending entirely on donations to live and share the Dhamma. If you want to help support Bhante, our teacher, please consider donating to this cause. Thank you and enjoy. Last week we began <clears throat> exploring the Mahanidana Sutta from the Diga Nikaya, from the Long Discourses, number 50, the great discourse on principle of causation. What gets things started? There's never just one thing. It's a matter of conditionality, various causes coming into being. But as Venerable Ananda, we saw in the beginning of the sutta, how he comes in and shares his thoughts on Patitya Samupada, principle of causations or conditioned origination or the principle of 12 links. In this case, it's nine, as we talked about last week. It's, it doesn't have the typical 12 links. It has nine. There's ignorance missing. There's uh, sankharas missing. And there's the sixth sense basis missing. But they're not missing, per se, because they're covered also um, in various ways. given the principle of conditionality. So we see Venerable Ananda approaching Lord Buddha and saying, Bhante, despite what, you know, I understand, I understand Patichasampala is, is complicated, but I get it. It's so simple. Despite the fact that it looks so complicated. And Lord Buddha says, no, don't say that, Anand. Remember, he was not, not a Venerable Ananda. But he nevertheless was able to understand conceptually. So Lord Buddha is here not just clarifying that mistake in Venerable Ananda's position, but also helping him to delve deeper into understanding the finer nuances of one link or one causal factor and another. And then we went through um, the whole series in a sense the outline basis, but then we also saw how there's this special relationship between nama, rupa, and, uh, which is uh, mind, uh, uh, form, basically, or um, mentality, materiality, we can think of it like that, or um, name and form, that's another way of saying it, that's Nama Rupa. And then we also saw the relationship that that has with Vijnana or consciousness. And how they, they bounce off of each other. So I invited you to think beyond the scope of linearity or linear thinking. A, B, C, D, one follows the other. It's, it doesn't work like that. So the 12 links of causal relations don't work in that fashion. So this requires us to expand our way of understanding the world around us or how we even think. We think in multiple dimensions. So imagine um, a piece of paper and it's just two dimensional. It has a length and it has a width. It doesn't have the z-axis, which is the depth. If we were to live and only understand the world through those two dimensions, then it means that we would not be able to see anything. If you lay the paper flat, you won't be able to see anything above it. If another being came from a three-dimensional world and tried to communicate with those quote-unquote beings on living in the two-dimensional world, those beings will not understand or fathom or even acknowledge their existence unless they're able to expand their scope of understanding, accepting reality. 
So here we see the connection between Nama and Rupa, because ultimately we're seeing uh, here the message that's being put across is not just for conditionality or causation, but it is for the causation of the birth of the new being, of the person. So it is in context, in, in that context that Lord Buddha is explaining it in detail. And here's where we're going to see the connection that, uh, in fact, the supremacy, uh, the, 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 the role, the very important role that consciousness has over everything else as it relates to the new birth of the person, of the being. In, in, in welcoming Nama Rupa, in allowing it to have a basis, a substrate for Nama Rupa to come and rest, specifically in, 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 in the new womb. So that's where we're headed. And here we're going to see how Lord Buddha is going to be continuing from last week's. Um, we got to point 13 here. Um, and these are numbers that uh, I have put, so you won't find them in the Pali uh, or some other translations. Uh, but uh, I, it makes it easier for us to follow through the logic um, and uh, to see the connection so we can retrace back where we might have missed a step or two. So we got to point number 30. So uh, let's begin. Seeking or longing itself then becomes the required condition for the desire to acquire things. So last week we talked about anything from um, uh, stinginess, how becoming passionate over things, uh, the identification which leads a person to become passionate over things and where individuals will even pick up uh, sticks and you know rods and knives and weapons and, and go after each other because of that identification, which also comes from, so Lord Buddha is talking about those finer nuances of, um, that underlie wrong action, unskillful action, evil action, bad merit-making actions, how they lead to that. And it's an un ending cycle if it's left to its own devices, to its own, you know, it's, it's like a car that's going at maximum speed, but without anyone at the steering wheel. So Lord Buddha says, this has also been declared by me. Now, here is how you must understand the meaning of that statement. Imagine, Ananda, that there was absolutely no presence of seeking or longing for anything by any being anywhere at all. So no one's seeking anything, no one's yearning, longing for anything. Now, if this were to be the case, where there would be absolutely no seeking or longing for anything by any being anywhere at all, and from such a complete absence and utter cessation of seeking or longing for anything, would there still be the presence of the desire to acquire things in the world? So if you're not seeking, if you're not longing for things, would there still be a desire to acquire things or the acquiring of it? Venerable Ananda says, no, blessed Lord. So you see, Ananda, seeking or longing for things itself is the very cause and reason, the one that has the direct causal relation to having the desire to acquire things, for it is its required condition. By having craving as a required condition, one starts seeking or longing after things. This has also been declared by me. Now, here is how you must understand the meaning of that statement. Imagine, Ananda, that there was absolutely no presence of craving for anything by any being anywhere at all. Now, if this were to be the case, where there would be absolutely no craving for anything by any being anywhere at all, and from such a complete absence and utter cessation of craving for anything, would there still be the presence of seeking or longing for anything in the world? So we're going, it's, it's um, you know, we're going backwards to see, remember, if you're trying to discover the ca causal uh, uh, or point of origin of something, you need to retrace the steps. You never take it for 
granted, yes, this is it, and that's it. And so we can start from that as a given. No, not in this Dhamma and discipline. We need to discover, we need to ask questions. We need to probe. That's where insight will come in. That's what insight is. Vipassana, that's what it is. The mind becomes so quiet that you're able to naturally, like the flowing water, filling up every depression, you will start understanding things. That's what Lord Buddha says again and again. Jnana dasana, the ability, the seeing, the understanding. Yatabhutan, how things come to be. So Venerable Ananda responds to that as well. Uh, like, would there still be the presence of seeking or longing for anything in the world in the absence of craving? No, blessed Lord. So you see, Ananda, craving for things itself is the very cause and reason, the one that has the direct causal relation to seeking or longing for things. For it is required condition. We have a tendency to oversimplify things often. We pick up a principle from any teaching, not just in regards to uh, the Dhamma, Buddhism. But we like to get these sound bites, we, these principles, or one word, uh, <laughs> one word explanations, as it were, where we just hang on or latch on to those as that's the teaching. For example, craving. It's like the big taboo thing in, in Buddhism. Oh, craving, yes, craving, tanha, yes. That's from everything where it starts. That's, that's the main culprit. That's, but we never explore who's the neighbor to this thing called craving. Who are the neighbors? Neighbors as in, what are the other factors that are coming alive thanks to the presence of craving? And where is craving coming from? We never question that. And that requires some effort. So that's what I mean by we oversimplify things. We need to understand. Wisdom will never fall from the sky. It will never go like when there was absence of wisdom and suddenly there is wisdom. No, that's not how it works. We need to be doing probing. We need to be understanding. That's why sati is so important. Sati is not a passive affair. You're not in the passenger seat of, of what's going on in your life. You're fully aware, sampajanya. Sati and sampajanya, those are the facilitators. Those are the ones that clean up the, the road for wisdom to be able to walk through into your mind, into your heart, and to be able to understand what's really happening. And that's where you go, oh, I get it. But it will never happen just like that without you having done the work. So it's not a matter of simply accepting principles just because. There needs to be an understanding of the mechanism behind it. And that's what Lord Buddha is providing for us, the blueprint of what really is taking place behind craving. In this manner, Ananda, these are the two manifestations of feeling itself. The causal relationship uh, for feeling is contact itself. Thus, it relies on the presence of contact as its required condition. So now we're understanding the basis of craving, uh, of how feeling arises in a sense, uh, because the feeling is Lord Buddha was explaining the connection between feeling and craving that follows. Because there was also upadana, the grabbing, the holding on. So Lord Buddha went into detail to show us the connection between feeling and craving. So Lord Buddha here is saying, causal relationship for feeling is contact itself. Thus, it relies on the presence of contact as its required condition. This has also been declared by me, so it's still elaborating. Now here's how you must understand the meaning of that statement. Imagine, Ananda, that there was absolutely no presence of contacting anything by any being anywhere at all. Now if this were to be the case, where there would be absolutely no contacting of anything by any being anywhere at all, and from such a complete absence and utter cessation of contact of anything, 
would there still be the presence of feeling? So if there's no contacting anything, would, still, would there still be feeling? No, blessed Lord. So you see, Ananda, contacting things itself is the very cause and reason, the one that has the direct causal relation to feeling, for it is its required condition. Remember, contact also is the second, ahara. Remember ahara, the nourishments we talked about, the four? First, we knew, uh, we know that it is the ingestible, consumable food that nourishes the body. That's first nourishment. The second is contact. The mind wants contact. To make contact. I was joking the other day uh, in, in terms of uh, what would happen if we uh, drop a person in the middle of, a, of an island, in the, in the middle of the ocean, on a deserted island, deserted because there's nobody else, just them. Birds, yes, that, that, but they still want to make contact with fellow human beings. That's why they want to run out of there, even though they might be in paradise. But there is no contact being made with another. This, this is how deep it is. Lord Buddha recognized this as a nourishment. The causal relationship for contact is nama rupa. Mm -hmm. Thus, it relies on the presence of nama rupa as its required condition. Now, in the typical structure of the 12 links, you would see there the six sense spheres or six sense bases, salayatana. Here, if you notice, there isn't one. So we went straight from contact to nama rupa. So we shouldn't panic. And Lord Buddha delivered the Paticca Samuppada in different steps, in different structures. Sometimes 12, sometimes less. So this is one uh, situation where he's giving it in less numerically, but the principle is intact. So the causal relationship for contact is Nama Rupa. Thus it relies on the presence of Nama Rupa as its required condition. This has also been declared by me. Now here is how you must understand the meaning of that statement. Imagine, Ananda, that, there, that the properties, qualities, indicators, and all other pertinent signs with which the Nama group could be represented were all, were all completely missing. So pertinent signs of which the Nama group are. Uh, last week I mentioned, uh, because there is uh, the commentators and a big chunk of the Buddhist community, uh, uh, monastics specifically, and commentators over the centuries. Unfortunately, they, uh, there's this, uh, uh, this schism, I would say, when it comes to Nama, understanding of Nama, uh, where they miss out the Samaditi Sutta and, and other suttas where Venerable Sariputta and Lord Buddha, of course, delineate what are within the Nama group. Okay? There's feeling, there's perception, there's intention, and there is contact, and there is attention, manasikara. So they switch the place and uh, they put consciousness there instead of. Uh, um, attention. So that is wrong. That is not the Dhamma. That's some commentator's mistake. So when we say here the uh, pertinent Nama group, that's what we're talking about. Now, if this were to be the case where there would be absolutely no way for the properties, qualities, indicators, and all other pertinent signs of the Nama group to function and be represented, and therefore from such a complete absence and utter cessation, of the functioning of the Nama group, would there still be the possibility for the mental designation contact to be made to identify what is occurring within the Rupa group? Now, uh, again, here would be a perfect, uh, you know, I'm going to use my hands as, as I've always done uh, instead of a whiteboard. But think of it in terms of Rupa, which I've talked about several times last week also. Uh, they are comprised of, the Rupa group is comprised of the four primaries or the four primary elements. Um, uh, we, you know, Patavi, for example, we, 
uh, Teju or fire, Patavi is earth. So earth, water, fire, and air. Those are the four primaries. So they stand for the qualities of um, hardness, solidity. They don't necessarily have to be material as such. They also take the other, their characteristics can befall other things like functionings within the body. Let's say fire, as I mentioned, it could be a, a marker for the way the brain works or the way, the way the intestines or digestive system works or the heart. Uh, water for fluidity uh, and air, um, the gases in the body. But if we were to um, have um, a rupa plus the nourishment that we get from mother and father and, and all that uh, and the, throughout the life of the person, so we get that in the rupa group. Now, the rupa will not uh, function, or the nama group, shall we say, because that's how Lord Buddha is positing the question. Nama group needs the substrate of the foundation of the rupa, the material. When we say materiality and mentality, we usually are, we should say mentality and materiality if we want to correspond with the Pali word, nama rupa. And remember, nama rupa doesn't have a hyphen, even though we like to put that in there in the English. But the Pali doesn't have any hyphens. So it's a one word. So they go hand in hand. So nama group needs the rupa group to become nama rupa, which will be essential for the new birth. Okay? Because these are like, think of them as the ingredients of a recipe. The recipe, the final product is the being, the person being reborn. So one of the first bundles of um, the package, or like last week, I think was saying, take all these Nama Rupa individual parts, ingredients, put them in a transparent bag. So they make up that one bag. Later on, we're going to come across the consciousness, so, which will now make Nama Rupa work together as a team, as a group, to facilitate, to augment, and to bring the consciousness part to life. Okay? So here is almost like a foreshadowing, as they say in, in, uh, in writing uh, classes, uh, like almost like predictive language of what's coming next. So here Lord Buddha is using the same method between Rupa and Nama group, which we will see happening between Vijnana and Nama Rupa. So you can approach it like that as well. So Lord Buddha says, if Nama Rupa would be, uh, uh, would there be a possibility if one of them is missing? And Venerable Ananda says, no, blessed Lord. And imagine also, Ananda, that the properties, qualities, indicators, and all other pertinent signs with which the Rupa group could be represented were all completely missing. Now, if this were to be the case, where there would be absolutely no way for the properties, qualities, indicators, and all other pertinent signs of the Rupa group to function and be represented. So now Lord Buddha alternated. So he's now saying, instead of earlier, he said Nama group, now he's saying Rupa group. Re represent. Therefore, from such a complete absence and utter cessation of the functioning of the Rupa group, would there still be the possibility for the sensory reflexive contact to be made by the Nama group? This is important, sensory reflexive contact. So in order for life to occur in this realm, uh, we need that contact. You cannot just have feeling perceptions and you know, uh, attention and intention um, and contact without there being rupa. That's the form part. That's the materiality part, as I was saying. The four great elements, the four great primaries. So Venerable Ananda also agrees, says, no, blessed Lord, it can't work. 
Now imagine also, Ananda, that the properties, qualities, indicators, and all other pertinent signs with which both the Nama and Rupa groups could be rep represented were all completely missing. So now neither of them are there. Now, if this were to be the case, where there would be absolutely no way for the properties, qualities, indicators, and all other pertinent signs of both the Nama and Rupa groups to function and be represented, and therefore, from such a complete absence and utter cessation of the functioning of both the Nama and Rupa groups together, would there still be the possibility for mental designation uh, contact or sensory reflexive contact to be made? It won't, because you still need, it's almost like ghostly existence. It doesn't work. It's like a dream, it's, it doesn't work. You see that bucket of gold, you reach for it, there's nothing you can't grab. So it's just images, there's, it doesn't work. It's not a full picture. It's not a full experience. There is no sensory reflexive contact. Um, and um, so Venerable Ananda responds, no blessed Lord. Then imagine Ananda that the properties, qualities, indicators, and all other pertinent signs with which Nama Rupa could be represented were all completely missing. Now, if this were to be the case, where there would be absolutely no way for the properties, qualities, indicators, and all other pertinent signs of Nama Rupa to be represented, and therefore, from such a complete absence of utter cessation of Nama Rupa, would there still be the possibility for contact to occur? No, blessed Lord. So you see, Ananda, Nama Rupa itself is the very cause and reason, the one that has the direct causal relation to contact for it is its required condition. Now, oftentimes you see in various suttas how Lord Buddha mentions, Nibbana is the ending of Nama Rupa. What does that mean? Well, he just explained it. We often, so this is bringing, the way I see it, the way I understand it, this is bringing Nibbana and making it more palatable, more, um, I'm going out on a limb here, more palatable, more tangible, more understandable, more rationally, um, <laughs> giving us the ability to somewhat, somewhat rationally outline it within certain parameters where it can be somewhat conceivable even though it cannot. It is the unconditioned. But through the back door of explaining to us what Nama Rupa is and how one group without the other will not function and how Nama Rupa is at the basis of contact. And if there is no contact, then it means Nama Rupa is ceased. Then we start to understand, ah, oh, could this be uh, the unestablished vijnana that the arahant is known to have? All these things uh, that we see, descriptions or accolades of what uh, the fourth level awakened person uh, functions, how they function in this you know, three-dimensional world, Again, this is, uh, you know, this is a, uh, uh, more on the heavier side of a sutta, a discourse. This is not, you know, uh, Sigalovada sutta or some other sutta where it's easier to understand. But this is a deep sutta. It's a, it's a beautiful sutta. Uh, but it, um, uh, it's not expected of you to just quickly get it. I mean, look at Venerable Ananda. Lord Buddha is going into deep explanations of each of these, and we're so grateful that he is doing this because so many things are clarified within the sutta, which you won't find in thousands of others. Here you will find it, such as the breakdown of Nama Rupa, for example, uh, Nama and Rupa, that is. So then Lord Buddha says, the causal relationship for Nama Rupa is consciousness itself. Thus, it relies on the presence of consciousness as its required condition. This has also been declared by me. Now, by the way, this is what Lord Buddha wanted 
to, you know, this is the highlight. This is where he's wanting to take Ananda to, because he would be constantly confronted by uh, other people, including bhikkhus, who came from the Brahmin sect or the idea of an Atman, a self being reborn from life to life. Uh, so they would bring up the question, so who's being reborn? So there's a self that's, you know, going from life to life. So the brain doesn't like, the mind does not like to probe deeper and try to uncover, unlayer this onion and say, well, wait a minute, there's no such thing. It's just a conditional things working, piling on top of each other. And then we're seeing it, oh, that's an onion. But it's a lot easier for us to go to say, and oh, that's an onion. Well, what is an onion? Let's peel it. There's none. It's like a palm tree. You peel it, peel it, peel it, peel it, a banana, plantain. You peel it, peel it, peel it, try to look for the hardwood. There isn't. You're going to go through the trunk of the plantain and you're still not going to hit anything but air. But it's a lot easier for us to look and say, oh, that's a tree. But if we want to understand and if we want to break free, we cannot just go on first impressions. We need to grow up. A child would look at a plantain tree and say, that's a plantain tree, but not somebody who's a noble disciple or working towards becoming an arahant. We have to go deeper and understand. So Lord Buddha is providing Ananda the actual um, um, logical structure, the formula, as well as the probing methodology for with which Ananda was very good because of his photographic memory to relay this message to all others, plus him understanding it personally, because this was crucial for him to uh, attain after Lord Buddha's death three months later. So here's how you must understand the meaning of that statement. Now, Ananda, if no consciousness were to ever, dis uh, were to ever descend into a mother's womb, would it still be possible for Nama Rupa to come together therein? Some uh, writers, some venerable ones have actually used this sentence as the, the uh, they would put the whole sutta, Mahanidana sutta into this powerful, powerful sentence questioned by Lord Buddha, because this is what it all boils down to, as they say. So if no consciousness were to ever descend into a mother's womb, would there still be, would it be possible for Nama Rupa to come together therein? No, blessed Lord, Ananda said. How about Ananda, if once conceived in a mother's womb, consciousness were to be cut off? Would it still be possible for Nama Rupa to be formed into a living fetus? No, blessed Lord. And once a child is born, Ananda, if the consciousness of the little boy or girl were to get cut off, would it still be possible for Nama Rupa to grow and develop into maturity? No, blessed Lord. So you see, Ananda, consciousness itself is the very cause and reason, the one that has the direct causal relation to Nama Rupa, for it is its required condition. So you pull out, you remove consciousness the whole thing falls apart. That's what Lord Buddha is saying. Now, interestingly enough, the causal relationship for consciousness is Nama Rupa itself. Thus, it relies on the presence of Nama Rupa as its required condition. This has also been declared by me. Here is how you must understand the meaning of that statement. Now, Ananda if consciousness were to never be established by nestling into Nama Rupa, would it then still be possible for the consequential instigation of more suffering to occur as a result of birth, getting old, sickness, and dying? So if consciousness is there uh, into the nestling Nama Rupa, would there still be... Uh, it would be uh, never to establish, I'm sorry, to never be established in Nama Rupa, would there still be these cyclical factors of suffering or getting old, dying, and, you know? No, blessed Lord. 
So you see, Ananda, Anama Rupa itself is the very cause and reason, the one that has the direct causal relation to consciousness, for it is its required condition. So earlier, if you notice, I said there's Lord Buddha is foreshadowing when he was talking about those two ingredients between, you know, two larger ingredients, Nama group and Rupa group, mentality and materiality, and how he was saying in order for there to be uh, the being, eventually, you need to have the Nama group intact, both groups. Here, you take that same formulaic structure and then superimpose it upon the relationship between Nama Rupa and consciousness. So if there is the Nama Rupa, but consciousness is not hooked up to it, it not, it's not nestled in it, then there won't be any being to experience suffering. This is also the scope and um, uh, so this is the extent and therefore the scope whereby the proce process of being born, getting old, sick, dying and being reborn could be discerned. So this is another way he's saying how you can discern the very beginning, the process of being born, how a person gets to be suffering. Like that old man I was saying last week who came complaining to Lord Buddha as to why we suffer. Why is there death? Why should there be death? He was complaining that death should not happen like billions of people around the world. And Lord Buddha asked him a very simple question which people still are unable to even fathom. Old man, were you born? We stop, we never consider that question. Because we are born, that's guaranteeing the fact that there will be suffering, old age, the wrinkles, knees not working, backache, neck ache, headache, every ache you can imagine, and death. And he continues, this is also the scope and limitation of using linguistic expressions, descriptions, and designations, the extent to which intellectual understanding could reach. The span to which the cycles of continued existences take place as they stretch out, bringing the person to this form of existence, which happens to be the manifestation of the coming together of Nama Rupa and consciousness, functioning together in a cohesive manner. So he's saying like, this is the extent of what language can break it down for you, for any listener to understand. So in essence, we can narrow it down, uh, putting it in a nutshell, uh, as the vernacular goes. Consciousness itself is the substrate that allows Nama Rupa to find a home. Home as in uh, an embryo, home as in a fetus, eventually, attached to the uterine wall where the umbilical will form where the child, you know, eventually the fetus, once it comes out, there's an infant living, breathing. That's when everything is functioning as, let's say, as it's supposed to. However, so basically the consciousness is the deciding factor, Lord Buddha is saying again and again. But when there is, for some reason, you have... Um, um, you know, you have uh, parents or parents who want to become parents, individual pu couples, partners, they want to have a baby, but no matter how much they try, and even though consciousness may be the seed or bija, it's called, of uh, consciousness um, descends, let's say, in the womb, but there is no nama rupa come and join for whatever reason. Nothing will happen. But what happens when there is the Nama Rupa or there was even consciousness? But somehow the connection got caught, got caught, cut off the consciousness. And that's what Lord Buddha also explained. And that's how we can understand oh, the phenomena of miscarriages. Miscarriages. Oftentimes, uh, one person is blamed, oh, she, or let's say usually the mother, uh, to be 
oh, she didn't protect herself. She did this, or she went uh, to a Zumba class or jumping up and down, or she did rock climbing or jumping. That's how she ended up. Well, maybe some part of it, but there's the karmic influences in the background playing their role. Not every consciousness and Namarupa joining together will be joined for life, meaning the person growing up into maturity and then dying as an adult, advanced in years. So oftentimes miscarriages happen and what you have coming out of the female's body is the remnants of Nama Rupa, specifically the Rupa portion, a dead piece of tissue, not a life form. But then you see uh, when you have these uh, early deliveries, premature births, where you see consciousness is still hanging on. I have uh, my, my, actually my, my nieces, when they were born, they were so small. And my brother describes how he could fit both of them in one palm. They were so small and no one was allowed to see them, be around them, etc., except for him. So, and now they're fully grown and they're, you know, over five feet tall, I think. So, but you see the consciousness was really tightly bound up with Nama Rupa. Now, could that bond break? Of course, that's what's, what's called death. It could happen at any moment. And this is where the karma of the person, the, the vipaka, uh, has a lot to do with it. Um, and um, so just some things to bear in mind. So stillborn is another name for that, where there is no vinyana there. So here we're, we need to see the, the vortex is another term for it. Um, vatta, vattati. It's in Pali, you can think of it like that, the verb. So there's this vortex that happening between vinyana and nama rupa. And it's all in the context, at least within the frame of this sutta, in, uh, in pertaining to the conception of the person, the, the, the fetus, the, the gestation period, the, um, the emerging coming out of the womb, and one's course of life. So you can think of it in terms of that. So the larger, you know, scope of, of that. So, um, so think of it in those terms. Um, so it's, it's um, yes. So I'll, I'll you know, let's, um, let's jump to the next section of the Mahanidana, which is the section on designating the self. And how is it, Ananda, that educated people describe the self? Ananda, they either designate it as being confined and of a definite shape, being tangible and of a physical nature, while saying myself has a definite shape and is of a physical nature. That is myself. They point at their body. They say, this is myself. These are the outlines of myself. Please do not invade my boundary. This is myself. So, or, Lord Buddha says, Ananda, they would designate it as having a tangible form and a physical nature, uh, but depicting it as unconfined and without boundaries. As they say, although myself has a physical nature, nevertheless, it remains without boundaries. So for them, it's a wider, much wider perhaps even limitless, uh, boundless. Nevertheless, giving it a physical attribute, seeing it as such. Or, Lord Buddha continues, Ananda, they would designate it as being of a formless and boundless nature. So now it's both boundless and formless. Doesn't even have a form. But while depicting it as confined and having a definite shape, as they say, myself is formless in its nature, nevertheless, it remains finite. So, uh, and by the way, you will be able to place here several of the world religions, several philosophical schools, especially of India at the time, but even those of today, 
of whether their concept of God or their self, what happens during life, after death especially, they will fall in one of these categories. Or Ananda, they would designate it as having a formless and boundless nature while also depicting it as infinite or infinite. As they say, myself is both formless and infinite in its nature. Now, Ananda, consider those who designate the self as being confined and of a definite shape, being tangible and of a physical nature. They either claim that the self has these particular qualities currently, or will have some su uh, such quality later in the future, at some point, perhaps after death. Or they have convinced themselves that they would somehow transform it into having those qualities, while they affirm, even though the self might not have those qualities now, yet I believe I will transform and refine, I will refine and to become that way. As a result of such thinking, it is proper to say that those who make such designations, believing in such theories, are merely holding on to the view that the self is confined and of a definite shape, being tangible and of a physical nature. We forget to consider often how many of the debates that were going on at the time of Lord Buddha had to do with the self. And that's why pretty much all schools of thought of India despise the Dhamma to this day, in fact. They wanted to make it part of them, their own belief system. That's what they used over centuries later. They merged Buddhism into their own lineage of, of avatars. And, you know, they made even Lord Buddha as a, a manifestation of a reborn version of, um, I guess, one of their gods, Shiva or somebody, and it just merged into them. So basically, it's, it's a thorn in the side of the Indian thinking when you remove the self. It's, it's in, to this day, people have such a difficult time swallowing that, accepting that. That's why they've, they have this uh, aggression, microaggression, or this desire to prove the Dhamma wrong. But it's not, sadly, it's not just the non-Buddhist. Buddhist monks themselves, over time, they've even constructed this Lala land of Nibbana land somewhere where Arahants will go and be reborn in that realm. What is being reborn there, my friend? Come over here. Let's talk over this. So what is this? What is this? What is that? Self. They still held on. This is happening also at the time of Lord Buddha. With several monks coming in and saying, yes, that's, uh, you know, that's what I understand from the teaching. They were teaching and preaching Brahmanism still, but still you know, wearing the bhikkhu's robe. So this is the reason why I'm explaining or going over this uh, a little bit more uh, is because it's such an, a crucial part of the teaching for us to understand. So we play so many tricks in our own views of ourselves the world, this versus that, this for the versus the other. But in many cases, we are simply perpetuating the same wrong view. So we have to be careful. And so there is no Dhamma police that will come in and extract that from you. You know, no, this is the individual's responsibility. That's why we need to go and check the suttas, sources, the primary sources. Suttas, meaning the Dhamma, you need to check the Vinaya, where there's a lot of Dhamma as well, and then relate that to your own experience of things, of the Dhamma, as you're following those bases, those foundational teachings. And then finding a teacher with whom you can converse and share these principles with, and then hearing what they have to say, somebody who are somebody who's, who's gone through this or has an understanding. Otherwise, it's like shooting in the dark. It's really difficult. So, further on, Anda, consider those who designate the self as having a tangible form and a physical form, but depicting it as unconfined and without boundaries. They either claim that the self has these particular qualities currently, 
or will have such qualities later in the future, at some point, perhaps after death, where they have convinced themselves as they would somehow transform it into having those qualities while they affirm, even though the self might not have those qualities now, yet I believe I will transform and refine them to become that way. As a result of such thinking, it is proper to say that those who make such designations believing in such theories are merely holding on to the view that the self has a tangible form and a physical nature, but depicting it as unconfined and without boundaries. Nowadays, what's happening a lot, I notice uh, um, there was one time, I think I was in Asia somewhere, and a person approached and uh, they had concluded in their mind that what I'm teaching, what the Dhamma is basically, is all about, uh, it's the same thing as Advaita. It's the same thing in their mind, like, you know. And I was like, wow, do you know anything about the Dhamma? You know, everybody's trying to push the Dhamma into their own tiny little worldview. So, you know, they, whatever they're comfortable with. I had one time uh, an elderly gentleman uh, who was very much devout Jain, who for some reason who had come to a Buddhist uh, uh, Vipassana retreat uh, with a visiting uh, Burmese uh, Sayado. So he wanted to take part and the Sayado asked me if I could help him. I was, I was a layman then to clarify some points and he was too busy to decide I was I can't blame him but this person this giant individual kept on telling me oh it's the same thing as in our religion oh it's the same thing as as Mahavir and I'm like scratching my head like which part so delusion is pretty it's 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 a such a bluey sticky thing it's so hard to get rid of for so many of us so I, Lord Buddha is here is inviting us to really question our own, what's, what's in the background playing? What is the self, me, myself? What is that? No, your belief, your understanding, your firm conviction that you are a Dhamma practitioner does not cut you clean from that. Constantly you need to check to see if there is such wrong view somewhere lurking in the background. As a result of such thinking, it is proper to say that those who make such designations believing in such theories are merely holding on to the view that the self is of formless and boundless nature. Further, Ananda considered those who designate the self as having a formless and boundless nature, while also depicting it as infinite. I don't think I skipped. It is the same structure, you know, primarily, but uh, please uh, do make you know avail yourselves of, of of this sutta and all the others that we've covered here and elsewhere. The PDFs are on the website, so please print them out, uh, go over them at your own pace because I might be rushing. Uh, so I uh, so you can go, you know, exploring it at your own pace. Uh, they either claim that the self has these particular qualities currently, or will have such qualities later in the future at some point perhaps after death, or they have convinced themselves that they would somehow transform it into having those qualities while they affirm, even though the self might not have those qualities now, et cetera, et cetera. In um, the Vedic or Brahmanic traditions, you will find, uh, you know, just like the river um, flows into the ocean and merges, becomes one, loses its identity, the name, and becomes one with the ocean. There's that principle. So you can bring that here. It's the same premise. You have similar thing in Sufism, where they have this principle called fana in Arabic. Fana means uh, loosely translated, finish, being done, annihilated, obliterated, and basically joined with God. You know, the, your identity is merged, which is very similar. Uh, to the one I just mentioned earlier. So these are all based on wrong view because there's still the concept of myself here and you over there, this versus the other. It's very simple. It's simplistic. It's looking at the onion as an onion. 
it's looking at the plantain tree as a tree, as it doesn't probe to understand. As a result of such thinking, it is proper to say that those who make such designations believing in such theories are merely holding on to the view that the self is of a formless and boundless nature, while also depicting it as infinite. You, say, you have this element also in Taoism, by the way. Uh, some people also um, have accused Buddhism to be another version of Taoism. Um, so every, you know, everybody's going to use their own lenses, I guess without understanding what they're really saying. And that, Ananda, is how educated people describe the self. It's interesting how the Lord Buddha says educated people. Um, section on not designating the self. And how, Ananda, that, how is it that, Ananda, that certain educated people not wanting to describe the self end up des designating it? not wanting to designate the self, but still end up designating it in some form because people want to turn things tangible to them, to grasp. And I, you know, Ananda, they don't designate it as being confined and of a definite shape, being tangible and of a physical nature, while saying myself has a definite shape and is of a physical nature. Nor would they designate it, Ananda, as having a tangible form and a physical. So they're the opposite of the earlier ones. Although myself has a, so, um, but while that, depicting it as unconfined and without, excuse me, boundaries, they say, although myself has a physical nature, nevertheless, it remains without boundaries. Nor would they designate it, Ananda, as being of a formless and boundless nature, but while depicting it as confined and having a definite shape, as they say, myself is formless in its nature. Nevertheless, it remains finite. Nor would they designate it so, and now Lord Buddha is going to uh, elaborate on each. Now, Ananda, consider those who don't designate the self as being confined and of a definite shape, being tangible and of a physical nature. They don't claim that the self has these qu uh, particular qualities currently, nor will have such qualities later in the future, at some point, even after death nor have they convinced themselves that they would somehow transform it into having those qualities while affirming, even though the self might not have those qualities now, yet I believe I will transform and refine to become that way. As a result of such thinking, it is proper to say that those who make such designations, not believing in such theories, are not holding on to the view that the self is confined and of a definite shape, being tangible and of a physical nature. Um, further, Ananda, consider those who don't designate the self as having a tangible form and a physical nature, but depicting it as unconfined and without boundaries. Um, they don't claim that the self has these particular qualities, nor will it have in the future. Um, as a result of such thinking, I'm jumping a few lines here to see if we can finish it today, because there's a repetition portion here. But uh, as a result of such thinking, it is proper to say that those who make such designations, not believing in such theories, are not holding on to the view that the self has a tangible form and a physical nature, but depicting it as unconfined and without boundaries. Further, Ananda, consider those who don't designate the self as formless and boundless in nature, but while depicting it as confined and having a definite shape. As a result of such thinking, it is proper to say that those who make such designations, not believing in such theories, are not holding on to the view that the self is formless and boundless in nature, but while depicting it as confined and having a definite shape. Further, Ananda, consider those who don't designate the self as having a formless and boundless nature, while also depicting it as infinite. As a result of such thinking, it is proper to say, that those who make such designations, not believing in such theories, are not holding on to the view that the self has a formless and boundless nature, while also depicting it as infinite. And that, Ananda, is how certain educated people not wanting to describe the self end up designating it. Section on assumptions about the self. And what, Ananda, are the assumptions of those who try to discuss the self? While becoming aware of certain feeling, they assume that, that, feeling to be, that feeling to be the self, stating, 
this feeling I'm experiencing is myself. So this is where feeling is part of Nama, Nama Rupa, particularly of Nama group. So the person look, you know, just, just identifies, selects their living experience and isolates the feeling portion and slaps onto it the label, aha, that's myself. I am my feelings. Or they claim this feeling I'm experiencing has nothing to do with myself. That's another position. Because myself is impervious to feelings. So I don't feel the pain. I don't feel this. So that's another way of designating or assuming the self to be. Or they claim this feeling I'm experiencing is separate from myself. Because even though myself does in fact experience feelings, nevertheless, it remains unaffected by them. Now, Ananda, to those who claim this feeling I'm experiencing is myself, your response should be the following. Friend, there are three kinds of feelings. Pleasant feeling, painful feeling, and neutral feeling. Now, which one out of the three do you assume to be yourself? This can stop a person in their tracks because nobody's ever asked them that question because feeling was sufficient to be the designator of a self. And now you're presenting this whole position that there are not just one, but three generally stated, by the way, types of feelings. We're not talking about emotions yet. Feelings. In Buddhism, we simplify. We just go after three main groups of feelings. After all, Ananda, when you are experiencing a pleasant feeling, it would be at the exclusion of the other two. That is, at that instant, neither painful feelings nor neutral feelings would be experienced, but only a pleasant feeling would be present. So they are their pleasant feeling, hmm? pleasurable feeling. And Ananda, when you are experiencing a painful feeling, it would be at the exclusion of the other two. That is, at the instant, neither pleasant feelings nor neutral feelings would be experienced, but only a painful feeling would be present. So we basically are going back and forth like ping pong. One racket is the painful. The other one is the pleasurable or the enjoyable, non-painful. And that's what we see feelings to be all about. But let's see what Lord Buddha says about neutral. And similarly, Ananda, when you are experiencing a neutral feeling, it would be at the exclusion of the other two. That is, at the instant, at that instant, neither pleasant feelings nor painful feelings would be experienced, but only a neutral feeling would be present. Remember, Ananda, pleasant feelings are impermanent and causally manifested. They are habitual tendencies that are prepared, sankhata or sankhara, and rely on various conditions. Hence, are subject to fade and waste away, for they all come to cessation sooner or later. Similarly, Ananda, painful feelings are impermanent and causally manifested. They are habitually ten habitual tendencies that are prepared and rely on various conditions. Hence, are subject to fade and waste away, for they all come to cessation sooner or later. Also, Ananda, neutral feelings are impermanent and causally manifested. There are habitual tendencies that are prepared and rely on various conditions. Hence, are subject to fade and waste away, for they all come to cessation sooner or later. While experiencing a pleasure feeling, pleasurable feeling, they exclaim, this feeling I'm having is who I am. It is myself. There is no separation between the two of us. And when that pleasurable feeling vanishes, this time they exclaim, I have lost myself. While experiencing a painful feeling, they exclaim, this feeling I'm having is who I am. It is myself. There is no separation between the two of us. And when that painful feeling vanishes, they, this time they exclaim, I have lost myself. Some people don't want to be happy because they find their identity within pain and suffering. That's why they keep going back to rehab, many people because they don't have the vision or the image in their mind, a possibility of them experiencing pleasurable feelings. 
or at least not the painful ones. While experiencing a neutral feeling, they exclaim, this feeling I'm having is who I am. It is myself. There is no separation between the two of us. And when that neutral feeling vanishes, this time they exclaim, I have lost myself. Thus, by assuming this feeling I'm experiencing is myself, what one would be referring to are conditioned things that are, by their very nature, impermanent. And as a result, the person becomes entangled while being tossed around between the extremes of experiencing pleasure and pain that are feelings subject to fading and wasting away sooner or later. It is for this reason that feelings should not be regarded as or assumed to be yourself. Now, as for those who claim this feeling I'm experiencing has nothing to do with myself, because myself is impervious to feelings, your response to them should be the following. But friend, when you're not feeling or experiencing anything whatsoever, could there still be the possibility to assume I am this in the first place? No, Bhante. Therefore, Ananda, for that reason, it is incorrect to accept the assumption. This feeling I'm experiencing has nothing to do with myself because myself is impervious to feeling. Because so long as you have Nama Rupa, you have Vijnana, you're going to feel. Why? Remember Nama Rupa? Its relationship to contact? If you have contact, you will have feeling. Period. So mentally, you can't sit there and say, well, I'm impervious to feelings. Thank you very much. I'm beyond feelings. Well, in, in some jhanic states, yes, but when you join the rest of us humans, once you come out of jhana, you're very much pervious to feelings. You can't will yourself out of having feelings so long as you're alive. And as for those who claim this feeling I'm experiencing is separate from myself, again, self here is Lord Buddha is going, you know, addressing individuals who were stuck on use of words. So Lord Buddha used the word self quite often to refer to himself and others. So he, was, he didn't deny the use of self. It's the substantiality of a self within, an essential, unchanging element, an Atman within the person. That's what he never accepted. But so the conventional usage of self is absolutely, you know, used. But there are people who would not use it and uh, use logic and rational thinking or whatever, or in this case, irrational thinking to get themselves out of it. Explain themselves out of having a self. So because even though myself does in fact experience feelings, nevertheless, it remains unaffected by them. So your response to them should be the following. Imagine, friends, my friend, if feelings were to simply vanish altogether, with no trace left of them. And if that were to be the case, where there would be absolutely no feeling at all, could there still be the possibility to assume, I am this in the first place? No, Bhante. Therefore, Ananda, for that reason, it is incorrect to accept the assumption. This feeling I'm experiencing is separate from myself. Because even though myself does in fact experience feelings, nevertheless, it remains unaffected by them. Now, Ananda, on account of a bhikkhu no longer assuming feelings to be the self, also in interesting how Lord Buddha used the word bhikkhu here. Remember earlier I was saying how so many bhikkhus had wrong views? Well, <laughs> because Lord Buddha is not going to sit down with each bhikkhu who has these wrong views uh, to teach them. So Venerable Ananda would know what to tell them um, instead, himself, you know. Also, no longer assuming that the self is impervious to feelings and no more claiming that even though the self does experience feelings, nevertheless, it remains unaffected by them. Being free from all these assumptions and views, then he stands unmoved and tranquil, for he no longer grabs onto anything as his own in the world. That's what we do, though. We love grabbing on to. We might not be grabbing on to family, possessions, car, titles, body even. But there is this something very incredibly attractive about 
views, opinion, beliefs. And those are the things that keep us in the dark. Oftentimes we forget that at the root of it all, you know, when you look at upadana, upadana, which is oftentimes translated in modern English translations as clinging or grasping, as I mentioned a few times, I like to instead to use the word grabbing, holding on, latching on, not wanting to let go, that fervent desire to hug the thing, unwilling to let go. Yes, it's all those things, but upadana also is a term for fuel. To give it fuel, sustenance, to keep the fire going. So, this whole thing about, well, the perpetuation of ignorance is coming from the perpetuation of wanting to continue this within us, the sense of hatred, the sense of anger, the sense of jealousy, the sense of being hurt, the sense of resentment. All of these are different aspects of the fuel being referred to here as upadana. That is another reason why we're holding on to our views. It's a protection mechanism. It's a protective mechanism that we've come to see, yes, this theory, this principle, this faith, this concept, this belief, yes, I can, yes, I can breathe in it. Yes, this, this gives me some soothing. So we grab onto it. But while we're doing that, what's, we need to ask what is the thing which is working in the background? What, you, what is it that is running the show? What is it that's causing us to maintain that fuel, keep, you know, like those Western movies where the train, you know, is like coal run, you know, like they have to constantly feed the engine with, with coal that's been mined. Well, the grasping or the grabbing, the holding on relies on Ignoring the importance of the three declarations or the three characteristics of existence, which are pervasive, which are found everywhere in, in our lives, every moment of our life, in fact. So that is the thing which is continuing the, the, to fuel the vortex I was mentioning between Nama Rupa and Vijnana. That's the life giving, not in a good light, by the way life-giving energy, the life force to the vortex, this deliberate ignoring or neglecting to consider the importance of what Lord Buddha declared as the first characteristic of existence, which is, there is nothing that is permanent. So stop looking for something that is permanent, not in love, not in family, not in your child, and your dog, and your cat, in your height, in your beauty, in your reputation, in everything, the body, the earth, the sky, your memories. So this is not a principle that we read about. And that's it. Anicca, yes, Anicca. I know Anicca. You know what follows it? Dukkha, yes, I know that one too. And I know the third one. Anatta, aha, so I'm good to go. That's not how it works. These, the neglectful attitude towards these three is the very mechanism that, that creates this dynamism uh, between Namarupa and Vinyana to keep them going to keep that dynamo as from junior high, I remember the magnet, electromagnetism, you know, creating a magnet with batteries, how it moves. So we first have to stop looking for permanency in things that are transitory, impermanent. 
because we need to consider that if there is nothing that is permanent, that also includes this pleasurable experience or feeling that I'm having that I wanted to put, you know, drop anchor on and say, this is what I like. This is who I am. This is what I want to have and maintain from now on. Why? Because it's going to produce pain, dissatisfaction, and dukkha. But what a normal person or putujana is doing is they are neglecting this second principle as well, which adds more fuel, the upadhanic fuel, the grabbing on fuel to maintain avijja fuel. And then because of that, we are also unable to admit to ourselves the fact that everything is changing, everything is transitory, everything is dissatisfactory, dissatisfactory or unsatisfactory, painful. There's nothing to call myself because I keep changing. I keep saying the other over there and this. I like this versus that. How come this and not that? That means the person added a persona, added a fixedness, uh, uh, concretized it, either this one or that. If you do one, you've done the other, basically. It's like designating a, a point on a, on a circle. Well, that's it. You just designated a point, and that becomes the beginning and the end of that circle. Before, there was none, until you put the X. So, without sounding philosophical or anything, these are questions that we need to ask ourselves. Because upadana, again, just like I was mentioning about wisdom does not fall from the sky. Upadana doesn't fall from the sky. You don't inherit it from your parents, you know. It needs perpetual involvement in the sense of holding on to wrong view. Ananda, once the bhikkhu directly knows and understands everything thus, he simply observes each of his feelings that arise, whether it is pleasant, painful, or neutral, as he sees that each of them are, in fact, impermanent and never lasting. Never lasting. When he sees this, he also understands that each of these feelings fade away and vanish, which leads him to become disenchanted with them. Then, in seeing and understanding how each of these feelings cease in their intensity, the bhikkhu becomes dispassionate towards them. This is the beautiful formula that indicates that the bhikkhu is becoming, you know, getting closer and closer to arahanship, because we see this formula so many times. We've seen this in the Pachalaya Manasutta with uh, Venerable Mahamugalana. We've seen this in Venerable Sona. We've seen this so many countless instances prior to attaining arahanship, where the dispassionate attitude must be there. You cannot be passionate and attain Nibbana, unlike what Tibetan Buddhism teaches or some other Theravada Buddhists teach these days. It's not possible. The disenchantment has to be so present in you it's like a sponge that's been put inside of a soapy water and it's been submerged there for hours. And then you pull it out and it's drenched fully. That's, that's your life with disenchantment. Uh, you don't become suicidal. You don't become negative towards life. You're just seeing things as they are. Oh, there's nothing for me to be passionate about. What is this thing called patriotism or what is this thing called, uh, you know, oh, I have to be dedicated. I have to give my life to this thing. There's, it's no longer that. You look at a, a poetry and you start like feeling sad for the poet's ignorance. The lyrics. You look at people's eyes and you, you're full of compassion. Dispassionate doesn't mean that you no longer have compassion. Absolutely not. As you're developing in your practice, your compassion throughout for all beings, human and non-human, 
becomes exponentially increased. They, it, it becomes unimaginably uh, matured from day to day. And this leads him to relinquish his grip from holding on to anything. By not grasping anything thus, he no longer becomes anxious, restless, or agitated. And by not becoming agitated anymore, he experiences the ultimate relief that is Nibbana. Lord Buddha just gave the formula again. Remember, I tell students all the time, one good, solid piece of advice that you can apply to yourself in your practice is, if there is agitation within you, then you are going away from Nibbana. You remember the, there was that game, like you would blind, they would blindfold you and they would, you know, you have to walk groping in the dark and they say, hotter, hotter, cold, cold, you know, you're getting warmer, you're getting hot. It's the same thing. So if you're feeling agitated, you're getting cold. But if there's contentment and peace and upekka growing, stillness, you're not sucked into the situation. You're not pulled into this or that type of feeling. You're getting warmer. But if on the other side, on the other hand, you're getting agitated, worried, this, that, you're not in, you're not close, you're getting farther and farther away from the Dhamma. So that's, that's another uh, clue you could, you could, uh, you know, have um, a shortcut, if you will. It is at that very instant that uh, when the bhikkhu finally knows the, with direct understanding, birth is now finally destroyed, that the holy life has now been fully lived with its goal achieved. And there is no more coming back to any state of becoming. Now, Ananda, a bhikkhu who has liberated himself by having reached this level of understanding, would never consider to be true or accurate any assumptions or views that pertain to the Tathagata, such as, so he would never accept or deny. <laughs> After his death, the Tathagata continues on living by moving into another form of existence. Or that after his death, the Tathagata no longer exists. Or that after his death, the Tathagata both exists and does not exist. Or that after his death, the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist. This is uh, what was the other hot topic that debaters used to engage in to discredit one another. And these four happen to be one of the 10 undeclared points because Lord Buddha, he had told you know, uh, Ananda and others, please, if somebody comes in with those 10 questions, I'm not interested. Don't even bother me no, because it doesn't do anything. And it's the lamest set of questions, if, if you ask me. I mean, it's just like, so what? Let's say he does exist. So that's what I came across constantly in Asia. I mean, at the end of every, you know, when I was present to other bhikkhus, you know, usually Asian, and you know, uh, in many cases, uh, when somebody would have died, you know, they would say, oh, may he so-and-so attain parinibbana, you know, after death. How do they know there is such a thing after death? They haven't found it while alive. It's, it's, it's you know, form of existence. Like this, people have come to believe that the Arahants and Lord Buddha are somewhere there living in a Nibbana land. It's, it's, it's totally Adhamma. Has no place in the Dhamma. It is completely false, wrong should be tossed out, but that's what you have. Majority of Buddhist countries, that's what they claim without even thinking twice about what they're, the nonsense that they're teaching people. So even though we have these beautifully laid out in the suttas, spoken by Lord Buddha, taught by Lord Buddha to his disciples, we blatantly go ahead and do the opposite. That's why you won't find that many people talking about the Mahanidana Sutta, or at least this portion of it, even if they do. And why would he never consider such, such assumptions or views to be true or accurate at all? 
Ananda, by understanding and directly knowing for himself the scope and, therefore, the very limitations of language and linguistic expression, the scope and limitations of naming and labeling things as such, the scope and limitations of all manner of expression, along with the use of various terms and principles, the scope and limitations of knowledge and the attempts at describing wisdom itself, and by understanding and directly knowing for himself the scope and the very limitations of rebirth through the cycles of samsara, and to what length they could reach out, and to declare such a liberated bhikkhu as someone who does not know and see, now that would be a complete mistake. So, uh, what a powerful, it's, it's an extended paragraph, I know it's just like loaded, but uh, how could he say yes or no? Why would he say yes, the Tathagata does exist or does not exist? How is that even remotely helping the questioner out of their dukkha? How in the world is that taking the person closer to Nibbana? Where is the Noble Eightfold Path in there, in those questions? The question itself must have some connection to the Noble Eightfold Path that's dying to be revealed. That's where the healing is. That's the Magga portion of the Four Noble Truths. So any question does not mean it deserves an answer. Because otherwise you're just going to go down the rabbit hole and you're never going to come out. Because you would be drifting, loitering around in samsara for a new you know, set of maha kappas. And good luck coming out of that. The seven levels of consciousness. It's uh, the sutta is not that far. You know, we think we're we can possibly do this today. Yes, Ananda. There are these seven classes of consciousness and the two spheres. And what are these seven? There are beings who are different from each other in both their physical appearance as well as in their thinking, much like human beings, along with some devas and some other beings found within the lower realms. This is the level, the first level of consciousness. There are beings who look different from each other in their physical appearance, but are unified in their thinking, such as those devas living in the company of the Brahma gods. This is the second level of consciousness. There are beings who look the same as others in their physical appearance, but who are different from each other in their thinking, such as the radiant or the abhasara devas. This is the third level of consciousness. There are beings who are indistinguishable, indistinguishable both in their physical appearance as well as their thinking from those of others, such as the beautifully lustrous or the subhakinha deva. Now this is the fourth level of consciousness. There are also beings who, having completely transcended by going beyond the confines of thinking in terms of the physical world and of tangibility, along with the disappearance of perceptions having to do with sensory reflexive context. So we're talking about arupa now by no longer paying any attention to the multiplicity of unending perceptions, and instead, while dwelling on the thought and experience of space being infinitely boundless, after the death of this body, they reappear in the realm called infinity of space. This is the fifth level of consciousness, Arupa Loka, versus Rupa Lokas, which the Brahma realms would be considered. Uh, there are beings who, having completely transcended the state of space, being infinitely boundless, and by experiencing how consciousness is infinite, after the death of this body, they reappear in the realm called infinity of consciousness. This is the sixth level of consciousness. And then there are those beings who, being, having completely transcended the state of consciousness, being infinitely boundless, and by experiencing the fact that there is nothing at all, after the death of this body, reappear in the realm called nothingness. This is the seventh level of consciousness. Finally, there is the sphere that pertains to beings that are no longer conscious or aware that they are perceiving. And secondly, the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. These, therefore, are the two spheres. So Lord Buddha here breaks the two apart uh, from the rest. Another thing you notice in the beginning part of the, uh, the structure of the, uh, this sutta uh, uh, 
seems to have come in the earlier part of the sasana's life. So you will see over time, Lord Buddha tweaked some of these uh, principles or classes of consciousness and organized them in a different way. So, uh, which drives scholars and academicians berserk because they, that's, that's their like, you know, bread and butter. They just love that instead of sitting down and actually practicing to ex experience these. So, but what I'm trying to say is you do see different arrangements, just like in the case of the asavas, for example, the um, balasava, uh, kamasava, balasava, vijasava. And then, you, so they had the three asavas, and then later on in the sasana, you see in Lord Buddha mentions fourth, dityasava. Um, so, but when you look at it, dityasava and avijasava, they're part of the same because um, the wrong view contaminant of wrong view is very much in line with the contaminant of ignorance. So you have these different designations. So we shouldn't make too much of them other than what they're trying to indicate. Ananda, as for the first level of consciousness where you have beings who are different from each other or in both their physical appearance as well as in their thinking, much like human beings are, along with some devas and some other beings found within the lower realms, now, if a person is able to know and see while fully understanding how this level of consciousness comes about in the first place, how it goes out, how it becomes attractive to those wanting to indulge in it, and thus its dangers and snares, and therefore the manner in which one can escape from it completely, would it still be appropriate or even possible for someone with that depth of understanding to go seeking delight and enjoyment in that first level of consciousness? So if a bhikkhu or a practitioner is able to see that this is also dangerous, this is no release. So who cares if there are beings that look different or look the same or think the same or think differently? Yes, in deva realms, there are devas who, for example, they look the same or they do look different, but they think the same. So they have the same mind. In one of the suttas I recently translated from the Anguttara Nikaya, there is such a case of devas approaching Lord Buddha and saying, Bhante Venable Sariputta is giving a discourse over there in Pubba Monastery. Perhaps it would be good if Lord Buddha would go and support Venable Sariputta. Lord Buddha goes and he explains. And then he also elaborates on the type of devas who were there visiting him. They were that kind of de devas. Different bodies, one mind. They all thought the same. Now, are they free from sansara? No. So such a bhikkhu um, is concerned, you know, looking at the whole thing. Ananda, as for the second level of consciousness, where you have beings who look different from each other in their physical appearance, but are unified in their thinking, just like the one I mentioned, uh, such as those devas living in the company of the Brahma gods. Now, if a person is able to know and see, Nyanadasana, they have that ability. While fully understanding how this level of consciousness comes about in the first place, how it goes out, how it becomes attractive to those wanting to indulge in it, and thus its dangers and snares, and therefore the manner in which one can escape from it completely. Would it still be appropriate or even possible for someone with that depth of understanding to go seeking delight and enjoyment in that second level of consciousness? No, but they. Ananda, as for the third level of consciousness, where you have beings who look the same as others in their physical appearance, but who are different from each other in their thinking, such as the radiant or abhasara devas. Same thing. And Venerable Ananda says, no, but. And Ananda, as for the fourth level of consciousness, where you have beings who are indistinguishable, both in their physical appearance as well as in their thinking, from those of others. So they're the same, such as the beautifully lustrous or subakinha deva. Now, if a person, you know, uh, is asking the same thing, would it still be appropriate for someone who has understood to go seeking delight without uh, uh, an enjoyment in that fourth level of consciousness? No, Bhante. How about Ananda as for the fifth level of consciousness, where you have beings who having completely transcended by going beyond the confines of thinking in terms of the physical world and of tangibility. So now we're going into infinity 
of space and infinity of consciousness and Venerable Ananda is giving the same response, no Bhante, because there's no release from those realms. Um, it, that, they themselves are not the release, that's what I meant. Um, it's just a different attainment. It's no different in the sense than being, you know, a human who's dying and saying, oh, I want to be reborn as the son of a very, very, very wealthy person. And you're born. Okay, you're still subject to old age, sickness, and death. Each of these realms have their corresponding deaths, you know. They have their corresponding, for that realm, for that level of consciousness, they have their own matching version of getting old. So no, if a person has seen, has understood, they just say, no, I'm not interested. Who cares about the infinity of consciousness realm? I don't want to be part of it. Unlike in the case of the nothingness realm and the non-perception perception of non-perception, uh, Venerable, uh, well, Lord Buddha, before he became Lord Buddha, as Siddhartha, his teachers, Alara Kalama was reborn in the realm of nothingness, and Uddhakarama Putta was born in the realm of neither perception nor non-perception, both unreachable realms. Totally useless realms when it comes to wisdom. It's like being tossed into a, a level of, well, a realm where you don't benefit. You're just reaping the benefits of your past. Come uh, enjoy that realm where you can't even perceive. That's why Lord Buddha wasn't even able to teach his past teachers any dhamma. They, they don't have that in that realm. But they live there for one for 60,000 mahakappas, the other one 84,000 mahakappas. So a person who sees this will say, no, I don't want to be seeking delight and enjoyment in that realm. I'm sorry, I don't want it. And that's only because the person has seen disenchantment has experienced, and is experiencing this passion. So that's why I feel sad for these individuals who say they have reached a high level of attainment or even are, are arahants, monks, who have huge followings. They're still busy building monastery after monastery, going around and, you know, getting a bigger crowd. It's like, no, that's, there's something wrong. Where's the dispassion? Where's the disenchantment? I don't see it. That's a natural growth that happens in the person. You don't get submerged back into life and seeking fame or wealth and recognition. No, it's the opposite that happens. Hmm. Ananda asks for the seventh level of consciousness. So this is he's now talking about the nothingness, where you have beings who having completely transcended the state of consciousness, being infinitely boundless, and by experiencing the fact that there's nothing at all, after the death of this body, reappear in the realm of called nothingness. Now, if a person is able to know and see while fully understanding how this level of consciousness comes about in the first place, how it goes out, how it becomes, excuse me, attractive to those wanting to indulge in it, and thus its dangers and snares, and therefore the manner in which one can escape from it completely, would it still be appropriate or even possible for someone who, with that depth of understanding, to go seeking delight and enjoyment in that seventh level of consciousness? No, Bhante. Further on, on the, regarding the two spheres, so again, the same thing is happening here, and Ananda says, no, Bhante. This is for the realm of nothingness, um, neither perception nor non-perception. Therefore, Ananda, the bhikkhu is able to know and see while fully understanding how these levels of consciousness and the two spheres come about in the first place, how they go out, how they become attractive to those wanting to indulge in them, and thus their dangers and snares and therefore the manner in which one escapes from them completely. And thus he is to be recognized as a bhikkhu who no longer, grabbing onto anything, has ended the ceaseless cycle of misery, for he has liberated himself through wisdom. This is the last portion, the eight freedoms. 
Ananda, there are these eight freedoms. Which eight? While still in this physical body, one sees forms. This is the first freedom. While not being able to see visible forms within himself, he nevertheless sees them externally. This is the second freedom. Intentionally seeing only what is beautiful. This is the third freedom. By the way, these are references for uh, the jhanas, uh, the nimittas, seeing forms, uh, form or signs, or in, some, in this case, it would be also rupa, which is sometimes a proxy used instead of nimitta. So um, intentionally seeing only what is beautiful. For example, in the mind, you look at something repulsive and you're seeing the beautiful in there. Intentionally. So the person having completely transcended, because that is in itself a freedom because it removes you from being identified with what the rest of the humanity is identified by. So you're no longer captured by you know, current narratives of Putujanas. The person having completely transcended by going beyond the confines of thinking in terms of the physical world and of tangibility, along with the disappearance of perceptions having to do with sensory reflexive contact. Again, now we're talking about the Arupa jhanas, because he's talking about infinity of space, jhanic state. This is the fourth freedom. By having completely transcended the state of space being infinitely boundless, and while experiencing how consciousness is infinite, the person enters the infinity of consciousness jhanic state. This is the fifth freedom. And while having completely transcended the level of consciousness being infinitely boundless, and by experiencing the fact that there is nothing at all, the person enters the nothingness jhanic state. This is the sixth freedom. Why freedom, by the way? In other places in the suttas, Lord Buddha says how Mara cannot touch you when you are in the jhanas, even in the first jhana. It's inconceivable for Mara. That's why you can only enter the jhanas if and when there are, there's a cessation of the five hindrances. By the way, be careful because I use the word cessation because some schools out there they teach that, oh, yes, cessation is achievable by everyone. No, that's not true. It doesn't go in accordance with the Dhamma. So, so the ending, or you restrain yourself, you, pra you protect yourself against the five hindrances. Now, you're beyond the realm of Mara. Mara functions within the realm of the five hindrances. The jhanas happen beyond the realm of five hindrances the jhanas. That's why you are freed, temporarily of course, from Mara snares. And with the complete sur surpassing of the nothingness level of consciousness, the person enters and remains in the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. This is the seventh freedom. Finally, by completely transcending the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception, the person enters and remains in the cessation of perception and feeling. This is the eighth freedom. Now, Ananda, when a person, when a bhikkhu is able to attain these eight liberations by moving through them one by one, as he goes in and out of each, whenever, wherever, and however he may desire to, and for as long as he likes, and when such a bhikkhu has destroyed the contaminants of the mind, the asavas, he lives in the taintless liberation of the heart. And through his own realization and direct knowledge, he attains full awakening by liberating himself through wisdom in this very life. Such a bhikkhu is declared to be liberated in both ways. And Ananda, there can be no other freedom, no liberation in both ways that may somehow be better or more sublime than this. That is what the Blessed One said. Fully contented, the Venerable Ananda and the other bhikkhus were delighted in listening to the Blessed One's word. Sadhu, sadhu. As you can tell, it's a it's a powerful sutta. Um, I in, in no way did I do it justice by, uh, especially because I had to go through it. Um, 
it, it's demanding. It, it, it really requires us to turn on the mental boosters, you know, the, to really get ourselves involved in the sense, okay, I have to delve deeper. Okay, what, what could this possibly be? By the way, the last reference to the uh, Lord Buddha's reference to both ways, um, all arahants are awakened. They're perfectly awakened, hence they are called arahants. Why? Because they have overcome the asavas, the three uh, hearts contaminants, which I mentioned earlier, kamasava, bhavasava, avijasava. But the added factor, is the use of jhanas, specifically the attainment of the uh, ninth jhana. Uh, ninth simply to designate it as different than the neither perception nor non-perception. The arahant-to-be does not take the route from nothingness realm, or from the, from the attainment of the realm of nothingness, which is the seventh jhana, uh, such an individual with necessary paramis, such a high superlative level of merits, um, and uh, some bojanga, the satta bojanga is working mad beautifully, uh, chooses not to take the path of neither perception nor non-perception. Instead, he will use the nothingness, realm of nothingness attainment, which is the seventh jhana to springboard himself to jump straight to cessation such a level of, of a person of practitioner and that happens for uh, uh, the lowest level is uh, an anagami or an arahant who wants to reattain that cessation level so uh, those two can only do that um, that cessation so they don't even bother with the neither perception nor non-perception because it doesn't bring anything. There's no, there's nothing there. But the cessation is 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 freedom basically for that type of a practitioner, especially for an arahant. Um, so that type of an arahant is liberated in both ways because they're liberated in both wisdom and in the context of jhanas through samatha practice, meaning specifically the cessation level of sanya vedaita niroda samapatti. That's the cessation of uh, perceptions and feelings. So, um, but as far as uh, attainment through wisdom, all of them do. That's why they're called arahants. So, but there is no like a different level of arahants. Oh, it's like a category two arahant. No, there's no such thing. They're all arahants because they have cut. The, the vortex is now no more. There is no upadana to grab them, to throw that seed of consciousness, if you will, into a new future life. There's no such thing because there's no desire because the dispassion has become so strong in them. Not even the highest of Radeva realms are appealing to them anymore. This is extremely important for each of us to really integrate the teaching in us on a daily basis to see whether I still have any longing for a Deva-like realm of existence. It might be very subtle, but it, but it, it can be detrimental. <laughs> unless you're not on But that seed can lead you to another birth. And then all it takes is a group of Nama Rupa to come in and say to Vinyana, okay, we're, we're doing this, like we've down count, done countless times. And in the, uh, in the bundles of reeds, Sutta, where Venerable Sariputta is teaching, uh, answering the questions of Venerable Mahakotita, his fellow Arahant, who had come to ask questions. Uh, a very similar uh, portion of the Sutta that we covered, uh, 
in connection to the Nama Rupa and consciousness. And Venerable Sariputta repeats what Lord Buddha said here. You have Nama Rupa because, because you have Vinyana. We have Vinyana because you have Nama Rupa. And then Mahakotita says, excuse me, friend, I'm kind of confused. He wasn't confused. He was saying it for his students. They're both Arahants. So which one is which? He says, ah, friend Mahakotita, think of them as two bundles of reeds, one leaning against the other. Vinyana, Nama Rupa. If you remove one, the other will fall. Like I was mentioning in the case of, of the conception. There's the embryo. Embryo is a fertilized egg. And which attaches itself to the uterine wall, which eventually turns into umbilical cord. And now you have a gestation period, the baby, well, the, the fetus. So when you have these two working, and they have to be sufficiently supported. So sometimes what happens is the uh, previous merits are so strong, especially in the case of Dhamma Chanda, which I've discussed with you, Chanda as in the desire for, in this case, Dhamma, not Kama Chanda, for sensual pleasures, but Dhamma, for the Dhamma. That comes in as a lovely glue to keep these things intact. Vijnana and Nama Rupa. Why? So that that in, now infant, once the baby comes out, their goal is very intentionally oriented. They want to attain. They want to taste the Dhamma. And that is a good birth. That is a good birth. And I like to, well, I feel uh, that many of you, if not all of you, have, are here today because of that upadana, <laughs> which is a good upadana in this case. It's a good fuel to seek out the Dhamma, to understand the Dhamma, to break free from the cyclical existences, to put an end to it in this body, in this form. And that's where we can. Because chances are, if you were to be reborn in a heavenly realm, you won't have the same urgency because there's not going to be much un well, unpleasant situations as you are surrounded by today. So let us use our birth wisely. Let us make the most of this vortex of vijnana and nama rupa coming together, not as another toy at the hands of Mara to play with us, to toss us around like a cat would toss a, a ball of twine. No but for us to reach the end of suffering. So with that, I will pause and see if there are any questions. I think we almost did two hours. But hey, it's, it's, it's a Mahai Nidana Sutta. It's a long discourse. That's why we don't do them often. Plus, translating them takes forever. Uh, but I don't mind. Uh, are there any thoughts, comments, questions? Okay. All right, let us transfer some there. Akasatha chabu matha deva nagama hindika punyantam anuditva chirang rakhan to loka sasanam. Akasatha chabu matha deva nagama hindika Punyantang anumoditva chirangra kantu desana. Akasatha chabu mata deva nagama hindika. Punyantang anumoditva chirangra kantu mamparanti. And you all be well. 
May you and your loved ones be protected. And may you protect yourselves from the sixth sense door. May the gatekeeper work beautifully. Burn is living <laughs> as you keep him in check with Satya and Sampajanya, gatekeeper, which is restraint. Restraint is very important. And uh, it's not just adding more data, but what we're doing with the data with these six sense doors active 24 seven. So you only hold the key to your own liberation. And you're the only one who's standing in the way, no one else, ultimately, each of us. So may the triple gems blessings be with you all. And may we make the most of this existence, this vortex of Nama Rupa and Vijnana and put an end to this nonsense <laughs> by attaining the goal of the holy life. Sukihot. Mm. Mm.